Okay, good morning, folks. Um, I, I made, a, I made a, very, a big mistake last week, uh, and I can say this because Ian, Ian is away. Um, but I said to him, Ian, I'm really getting a bit, I'm getting a bit fed up of um, sitting in church wearing a mask all the time now, you know? When, when is this going to change? And he said, I said, is there anywhere in the church that I can go that I don't have to wear a mask? And he says, yes, the platform. So that's why I've ended up here, folks. <laughs> So, good morning, but what it does give me is the, the privilege and the pleasure of extending a very warm welcome with my co-chairperson, Isla. So, uh, a very good uh, morning to you and a very warm welcome. If you're visiting with us for the first time, uh, it's great to see you. Please make yourself known to, to myself and Isla and some of the team at the end. We'd love to get to know you and, and chat a bit more to you. And a warm welcome to those uh, online as well uh, at, at home. Oh, there we, there we go. Yeah, we just want to say a warm welcome to all you kids as well. We love having so many children here with us, whether that's here in the building or at home as well. So we want to say a big welcome to you. Um, yeah, as you may have noticed, um, Chris and Hannah don't look like they normally do. Um, so we've got a lot of our church and our staff team away at the District Assembly in Northern Ireland this weekend. So yeah, um, I've seen a few photos and things like that. So it looks like it's been a really good weekend. Um, so we're praying for them as it goes well. I think it ends tomorrow possibly. Um, yeah, so this morning we've got um, Brian Sutter sharing with us, um, so we're really excited for that. Um, yeah, and we've got a video to watch just, just now. Um, we showed it last week just about the marriage course, so we're just going to watch that just now. Thanks. Marriage is more than your love for each other. It takes commitment and courage, making sacrifices for the sake of someone else. And at its best is an adventure of love that lasts a lifetime. From our marriage and your marriage, the ripples go out and out and out, for better or for worse, touching and affecting the lives of many people. Every marriage has the potential to leave a legacy of love. The marriage and pre-marriage courses offer practical tools for couples wanting to prepare for and build a strong marriage. I genuinely didn't realize that we would need to go on the marriage course until we went on it. We were so excited about the marriage course because it completely shifted our life. It opened our eyes totally in different way of communication. Because it's not that I'm against him or him against me. You two become a team. The love languages are words of affirmation, gifts or presents, quality time, kind actions, and physical touch. For the first time in human history, we have a science of love. Can you imagine that? We will work at this marriage together. That's the way to find a love that lasts a lifetime. Okay, the first slide, guys. Thank you. Um, the key, key words that jumped out for me during that video, which I really enjoyed, adds to Chris's uh, use of MOT last week for, for those who are married. I like that. The, the, the first word was investment. And this marriage course is really about giving everyone, married couples, the time to invest in their marriage and build a stronger marriage. Commitment was the second word, uh, helping us to deal with difficult times and difficult issues, perhaps. And legacy, a legacy of love. I've never thought of, of my marriage as a, a legacy of love before, but I like that. And the video picked that up. Lastly, about learning together. Uh, Elsa and I went on the marriage course some time ago uh, and I was reminded of what I learned on that course. I learned the most important four words for a successful marriage. I will do the dishes. <laughs> and I, I, I remind myself about them every day. I'll do the dishes. And there's actually another four and dry them too. So I, 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 uh, I take that with me all the, all the time. Um, the second slide, guys, please, thank you. Um, we are really excited about our marriage course. It's going to be a hybrid type of event. So the first night starts on the 28th of, of March at 7.30 here in the church, probably over, over in the old building. We've got nine couples signed up already, which is great. Um, so there's plenty more, plenty of space for more. Uh, but please register by next Sunday at that email address on the slide there because we need to get organized, you know, for, for catering, for uh, 
uh, books and for the, the material, which I'll come to in a minute. Uh, each, each, each guest needs a, a, a booklet. So please register on that uh, email if you're interested. If you haven't already or you want to find out more, please do that. Uh, next slide, please, guys. And the guest journal, every guest needs a journal. And again, come and chat to Alice and I at the end of the service. They're £10 each. And the reason I've pushed for next Sunday to kind of register, or if you can register by next Sunday, is that it gives us time to get these ordered and organized for the 28th. Uh, and that would, be, that would be great. Okay, so let's, let's prepare for prayer. I'll ask the band to come up just now, actually, that might be better. The band can come up and then uh, let's just prepare our hearts and our minds for prayer. I heard a quote the other day that went like this. Decades go past where nothing happens. Then weeks go past where decades happen. We're living in difficult days. We're living in challenging times. We're living in anxious days, difficult days. But we read in God's word in Philippians chapter 4. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Fix your thoughts on what is true, what is honorable, what is right and pure and lovely and admirable. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads and our hearts in prayer. Lord Jesus, we have come into your house. We are gathered in your name to worship you. Lord, turn our worries into worship. Turn our fears into faith. Lord, fill this place with your spirit with your precious spirit, we pray. Lord, fill us with your peace. That peace that we've read about in your word. Thank you for your word. Lord, we want to lift up holy hands and magnify your name. Thank you for the freedom to meet and to worship. But Lord, we remember those whose freedom has been bombed and blasted away. We pray for the situation in Ukraine. Lord, have mercy. Come and heal our land. Cleanse with your holy fire. Heal with your touch. We stand in solidarity and in sorrow. Lord, have mercy. We pray for our world, for world leaders, for wisdom. Lord, we pray for peace. Humbly we bow and call upon you now. Lord, have mercy on us. We pray for our church. We pray for those who are away this weekend. We thank you for our church. Lord, we pray for our marriage course. We pray for protection of our marriages. Bless our course, we ask. We want it to be fun and through the seven sessions to see strengthened marriages. Lord, as we come to worship in song now, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, guys.
least you think to put something on, so that's that's a relief. Um, but the thing is, you know, outwardly we dress, but maybe just have a consideration about in your heart, what is your heart clothed in? You know, have you joy in your heart? Have you peace in your heart? Or is do you have that a spirit of despair or some oppression? And I'd encourage you, you know, we're, as we sing, blessed be your name um, in the land that is plentiful. I'd encourage you to, you know, if you feel a sense of heaviness or, you know, outwardly, yes, you know, you're smiling, but inwardly you're struggling. I'd encourage you just to, you know, put your hands out and say, Lord, would you just lift this from me? Because that's what it's all about, that he, he wants to put that peace. He wants to put that joy in your heart. And I'd encourage you as we're singing you know, in your own heart, just take off whatever it is that's holding you back and give room to Jesus in your heart. Let him give you that garment of praise.
Breath. 
we're just going to sing one more song, but feel free to sit down, and feel free to stand still, and it's just going to be a bit more of a reflective song, and, and then I'll come up and pray again.
Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, that you're here with us. Lord, thank you that you love us so much. Thank you that we can come to you freely, no matter where we are or who we are or what we've been doing, God. Thank you that you welcome us with open arms. God, I pray for our kids as they've gone off to, to kids' church. God, I pray that they would have such a good time that you'd look after them and look after the leaders that are in charge. God, I thank you for them. Thank you that we're one giant family here. Thank you that's such a blessing to us. God, we want to pray for Brian as he comes to speak to us now. We thank you for him. Thank you for his life and his heart for you. God, I pray that you would speak through him to us this morning. In your name, amen. It's just that there's a donkey trying to work the system. So. Everybody hear me now, is that better? Eh? Okay. So we're thinking today, we're at the second part of our series about Speak Jesus. And we're thinking today about speaking Jesus into and over our community. And I'm thinking about how do we speak Jesus? And I think the starting point has probably got to be conversations, hasn't it? And conversations are a really big part of life. And there's all sorts of conversations that we have. And sometimes we have awkward conversations, don't we? And I, I was selling tickets in a ticket office in Glasgow and there was a great big long queue. And this young guy joined the end of the queue and he shouted in a really loud voice, hey, Brian, how you doing? I said, I'm fine. I couldn't think who he was. He said, do you know, remember me? He said, we met when you were in Northern Side. And Northern Side, the prison. <laughs> <laughs> And we, I used to be in a gospel band, and we used to go around all these prisons, not inside the Young Offenders Institution, you see. And, I, and I'm going like, oh, but you know, I was only visiting, you know, and, and all these people in the queue are looking at me as if, you know, what was he doing in Northern Side, you know, and why is he selling tickets here today, you know. So it's a kind of super awkward situation, eh? And then another time when I was in charge of the YP, which was a very long time ago, there was a training for freedom program. And we were encouraged to take prisoners for lunch. And so I, I said to the rest of the, the people in the wife, look, you can use my house, but I can't cook. You know, I said, my signature dish is soup, lentil soup, you know. So I'll do the lentil soup. And somebody else said, well, I'll make the dinner. And somebody else said, well, I'll bring a pudding, okay? So, so I said, that's great. So we got together and we got an armed robbery and two lifers. And I don't know if any, some of you might remember, but Paula Fumi was there. And uh, Paul has got a great sense of humor and turn the phrase. So we just started in to the starter, and she was talking about something down the town. And she said, oh, she said, that was daylight robbery. I said, not take that, you know. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, you know. And then we got through the meal, and we got towards the dessert, and Paula says, I could murder a pudding. <laughs> so, and then, of course, it was, uh, fortunately, prisoners have got a sense of humor, so they all saw the funny side of it. Nobody was deeply offended. But sometimes we have difficult conversations. And in our family, my wife keeps saying to me, you know, you need to talk to about this, you know? And you need to talk to about that, right? And somehow, all these difficult conversations come my direction. I'm the person that needs to talk about them. Have you had that in your family, you know? That's a difficult decision, and you're the person that needs to talk about it, you know? And so, conversations, we have cruel conversations. People say cruel things in conversations that absolutely dis decimate and destroy other people's lives. And, and, and then there's sensitive conversations that, you know, it's helpful for people if we can just deal with them in a sensitive way. But, you know, when we look at Jesus' life, Jesus had far more conversations than he preached sermons. And uh, maybe there's a message in that for us in the church today, you know. But Jesus had a lot of conversations. The longest conversation he had with, was with a woman at the well, and we're going to think a wee bit about that, and his last conversation was with a thief. 
on the cross. And it was a short conversation. But I'd like us to think, first of all, about this conversation that he had with this lady. Now, Jesus went from Israel into Samaria, and he came to a place called Syrica. And there was a place there called Jacob's Well. And this lady came out at midday when Jesus was sat in the well and didn't have anything to get water. She came out at midday. She came at midday because she had a bit of a reputation as a person, right? And so people didn't really want to be with her at the well. And so she's getting water for herself, which was unusual in the heat of the day, which was unusual. And she's this long conversation with Jesus. And, and she's a Samaritan woman. So this, the, the conversation starts. She says, can you get me some water? And she sort of says, why would I get you water? You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. And we all hate one another, right? So the conversation went a wee bit about the Jews and Samaritans and the, the differences between them and, and, and so forth. And, and, and then it led into an interesting conversation. Jesus got very philosophical with her and said, well, the water down here is just, but I can give you the water of life. And so they have an interesting conversation about how Jesus is the water of life. And, and the woman gets really interested in the conversation. And then Jesus gets really personal. And we're going to come to these verses now. And Jesus says this, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. And this is the type of conversation that Jesus wants to have. He wants to get personal with us. He wants us and to be talking about these intimate things. And he, he demonstrates to the woman that he's omniscient. That means he knows everything. And that's the amazing thing this morning. You may have come into this church service and we don't know anything about your background and what problems you may have brought in with you today. But Jesus is omniscient. He knows everything about you. He understands everything about your circumstances, exactly what they are. And he's not condemning you as you come into his presence today. He wants to accept you and have dialogue with you as you come into his presence this morning. And then he goes into a bit more discussion with her about about where they should be worshipping. The Jews said one place, the Samaritans said another. And he, Jesus says something really profound to her. He says, it really doesn't matter where you worship. The true worshippers worship God in spirit and in truth. And his message to her was, you can worship God in spirit and truth. And then he tells her that he's the Messiah. And then, this is what happens. She leaves her water jar and she went back in the town and she told everybody about what had happened. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Long conversation, amazing story. And there are three takeaways I take from this story. And the first takeaway I take from this story is this. Jesus will speak to anyone and everyone. He'll do it anywhere and he'll also do it any time. And I have to tell you, if we're going to take Jesus to our community, we have to copy what Jesus did here. We have to engage in conversation with people, and we have to speak to anyone at any time, anywhere, and we have to speak to everyone. We have to have no discrimination in who we have conversations with in our community. And the reason we have to do this is the people that are going up and down that Glasgow road in their cars just now are not going to come in here and hear this message that I'm sharing this morning. The only way they're going to learn this message is if they meet you on Monday morning at your work and you have a conversation with them about Jesus. That's how they're going to find out about Jesus. And so we have to emulate what Jesus did. And we have to share that message of the gospel in every situation. Now, two weeks back, just after the Ukraine war, I was in the office and we got onto a subject about fallout shelters and radiation tablets and all sorts of different things. And somebody said to me, what do you think is going to happen? I said, I don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows what's going to happen. I said, but you know, the Bible talks about a great tribulation. And I said, if you read these prophecies, and I said, this is in my office where all, all the staff, I said, if you, if you read these prophecies, they're 2,000 years old. 
And yet there's a, an amazingly accurate reflection about a nuclear winter and what happens in a nuclear war. And I said, I don't know if we're on the edge of that great tribulation or not. I said, but I know that Jesus spoke about this. And can I tell you folks, we need to be talking more about Jesus coming back. And we need to be talking about this in our places of work and when we meet people out on the street. We need to be talking about this to one another as Christians. We need to remind one another that Jesus Christ is coming back. Now, I'm not forecasting anything, but thank you. We need to be speaking about this because the world out there needs to hear this message that Jesus is coming back. Last weekend, I was in London with my granddaughters, and I thought I was doing rather well, you know, daddy daycare. I took them to this place, fun place, and all the rest of it, you know. And we're getting on great with these two wee lasses, and I'm walking down the street with them. And I was feeling so good. I'm feeling so good. And I said, you know, I'm just feeling so happy, girls, you know. And I'm walking down the street. And then I said, how, do, how are you girls feeling, right? And, and one of them says, I'm sad. <laughs> and the other one says, I'm angry, right? And I'm thinking, what are, these, what are they teaching these wee people at school? Apparently now... But we just used to think that Wayne's were all just happy as the day was long. And that's my generation, you know. But apparently now when they go to nursery, they're talking about their feelings. That's actually a good thing to do. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do. But every, these Wayne's are used to people talking about their feelings, you see. So anyway, I thought, I better find it. So I said to them, why, why, are, you, why are you feeling like that? And they said, well, because they wanted their mum. <laughs> Which I guess was quite, they seemed really happy with me up to that point. But anyway, because I was taking them for chocolate eggs and, you know, I, and I always bribe children to try and get them to like me. You know, I know how to do this. I've been doing it for many years. Anyway, I thought, I'm not leaving this conversation here. And I knelt down beside them. And I said to them, girls, you've always got to remember this. Jesus can make you happy. And I'll tell you, folks, we need to be talking Jesus over our families in these days. We need to be speaking about Jesus to our small children. Because I'll tell you, what they're learning at school is odious. And we need to speak Jesus over our children and into our family situations in these days in which we are living. Then we come to health issues. Why do we always wait until we're almost with no hope in our health situation before we bring it to Jesus? Do you ever ask yourself that question? I asked that question of Isaac Pretorius, who's a guy we work with in South Africa, amazing ministry, healing ministry. I said to him, Isaac, why do you see these healings in Africa and we don't see that type of healing or that scale of healing in Europe? He said, Brian, it's really, really simple. He said, in Africa, when we fall ill, the first thing we do is tell Jesus. He said, in Europe, when you fall ill, the first thing you do is go to the doctor. He said, and then after you've done everything else, you then bring it to Jesus. But we need to speak Jesus over our health situations. We need to be speaking about Jesus in our schools, in our golf clubs, in our shops. We need to have these conversations. And the second takeaway from it is this. Jesus knows everything about everyone. Now, that's hard for us to comprehend, but this is what's important about this. When you have a conversation with someone, God knows everything about that person before you start the conversation. And the Holy Spirit has prepared the word for you to have that conversation with them. So we must remember that when we speak into a situation, that Jesus already knows everything about it. And the final takeaway on the conversations is this. I noticed this from this story. Conversations with Jesus lead to conversations about Jesus. Once this woman had a conversation with Jesus, she couldn't stop talking about him. She went straight in the town and she was yapping to everybody. And then the next thing is the folk all came with her to see Jesus, right? And they came to the well. 
And the disciples came back to the well. They couldn't believe Jesus was talking to this woman. Next thing, half the village has come back with her. She's saying, come see this man that told me everything about me, right? Come see this Jesus, the Messiah. Come and see him. And maybe there's a reason. I want to ask you this question. When was the last time you had a conversation with someone about Jesus? There might be an explanation for this. Because unless you're having conversations with Jesus, you're not going to be motivated to have conversations about Jesus. So why are we not doing more of these conversations? Well, my mother should have been a nun. She was never away from the church. She played the piano at every meeting. And I got dragged behind her as a small child or whatever to all these things. But I'll tell you something. She was always having conversations about Jesus. Because she would talk to people at the bus stop. She would treat people she met in the street. Because I remember this as a small child, right? And sometimes she got really blessed. She went over the top. And I, one day we were going down the bus down the town, right? And we, on these old buses, there was a, a seat that faced everybody else. A reverse seat, right? It was the last seat in the bus anybody was sitting. Because when you were sat there, everybody else was looking at you, right? And that's the seat we ended up in. And she's singing... What a friend we have in Jesus, right? And everybody in the bus is staring at us, you know. And thinking, you know, I'm thinking, Mommy, going to shut up, you know. We're going to be quiet, you know. Why are you doing this, you know? And, I'm, and then I'm thinking, if you keep going on like this, the only friend I'll have is Jesus. <laughs> Maybe else will want to talk to me, right? Okay. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. There's people sat here this morning because my mother had a conversation with him about Jesus. And we need to have conversations about Jesus. But the second thing about getting in to how we're going to get this message across in our community, sometimes conversations have got their limitations. And sometimes we've got to go beyond the conversational and we have to be relational in how we deal with people. And that means that we go beyond the conversation to doing something with that person. Not just speaking to them, but getting involved in their lives. Sandy Miller, who's one of the co-founders of the Alpha, tells a great story. He was on a tube train in London, and it was packed, absolutely packed. And Sandy was squeezed up against one of the windows, and the door opened, and this friend came in that was a Christian. Uh, Sandy wasn't a Christian at that time. And the guy shouts across to him, Do you know the Lord? And Sandy's going, If you died, would you go to heaven, Sandy? And Sandy's going, What are you going for your holidays this year? Yes, you know. This is not a conversation you want to have across a tube train. And Sandy realized that this type of evangelism was really ineffective. And so with a group of other people, including Nicky Gumbel, they started the Alpha Course. And the Alpha Course recognizes this. You need to sit down and have food with someone. You need to get a relationship with someone before you can really, really share Jesus with them effectively, right? And so we go beyond conversation. I worked beside a guy when I worked on the buses. His name was Jim Fairley. It's actually his son is now the MSP for West Persia. And Jim and I worked together and, and we got on well together, but we always were having conversations that were arguments about everything. Jim's family were Catholics, my family were Protestants. Jim was a, was a Republican and I was a Royalist. He, Jim was a, 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 you know, a Communist and I was a welfare capitalist. Jim was an ardent atheist and I was a committed Christian. And every time we stopped at the terminus, we started these discussions. The bus ran late all the time. People must have hated when we were on duty because the bus was always running late because we were talking all the time, you know. At the terminus, we get in and say, okay, we'll, we'll finish that. We'll, we'll discuss it when we get to Rannick Road. We'll have to go. The, fo the folk are waiting to get on the bus, right? So it was that kind of relationship. And years and years. So anyway, at, just during that time, this seems like an unrelated issue, right? But what, in the YP, we were doing a treasure hunt one, one, a treasure hunt one Friday evening. And a friend and I that were doing the treasure hunt, we went down the street past Mill Street and we got to the congregational kirk and there was a tinker woman and she was 
absolutely mortal with drink, and she had two wee bits of bairns <laughs> lying next to her. And so we stopped, and I said to my friend, look, you keep your eye on them, because make sure the bairns are all right. I'll go and get my van, and we'll take them home. So I went and got this wee van I had, and we got them in the van, you know, staggered in the van, you know. We got up to Inveramon, she lived in a tent up at Inveramon, and nearly got mauled to death by her dog. I remember its name was Rory. And she kept, good Rory, good And that was a great big white old station. I'm terrified of dogs, right? I never thought any more about this. This incident happened. I never thought any more about it. Years and years after this, somebody was speaking to Jim Fairley, and my name came up in the conversation. And Jim said, well, I said, I'll tell you something. He said, I've had many arguments with him, and I've disagreed with him about a lot of things. But I would say this about the man. He said, I believe his faith is real. And the person said, why do you think that? And he, re he related the story about the woman that we picked up off the street that night. I, 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 re I hesitated to relay this story to you because it shows me in a really good light. I'm going to make a confession to you. I've more often been the person that walked by on the other side, okay? I'm not that good, right? But I tell you the story for this reason, right? One action of love speaks more volume than a hundred sermons or a thousand arguments. And, and we have to realize this, that as Christians, when we do compassionate acts, when we allow Jesus to do his compassionate acts through us, because it's not us, it's him that's doing this work, right? When we allow him to work through us and do these compassionate acts, it has a very strong effect on those who are round about and those who we meet. Our testimony is more important than our talk. And Jesus, most of his ministry was relational. He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. He fed people. He was the friend of sinners. And that befriending sinners, relational thing, I want us to do our scripture reading now. It's going to come up on the screen. And this is what we're going to do this morning, folks. We're going to read the scripture together the way they do in the Orthodox Christian tradition. That is, we stand for the reading of the scripture because it's God's word. And we'll read it together. So please stand with me. And we're going to read together Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once, welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Amen. The Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his own precious word. Now we all know how difficult and controlling we men can be. And people that live with me know all about that. And can I say, Vladimir Putin, we all know about difficult we men in our world and the havoc they can cause. But this, was a, this was a difficult wee man, but Jesus touched him and transformed him. And there are a few takeaways from this story that I want us to share. And the first takeaway I want to say about this is, 
We need to connect before we correct. You see, Jesus came along. He could have, he could have made a spectacle of Zacchaeus. He could have shouted up in the tree, you scurrilous little rascal. You've cheated everybody in the village. And everybody would go, yes, Jesus, let him have it, you know, you know. Hope he falls out of the tree, you know, and now you've shown he's up there, you know. He couldn't have done that, eh? He could have made a fool of him, and, and everybody would have cheered Jesus on, you know. But Jesus did a very unpopular thing. He said, I'm coming to your house. And everybody said, look, him, what's he doing that for? This, this is the worst guy in the village, and he's going to his house. And this is what Alpha's all about. We have to connect with people first before we'll see the correction in their behavior. We have to have meaningful friendships with people out with this building. <laughs> I'm going to repeat that. Because some of us get very caught up in the church. We need to have meaningful friendships with people out with this building so that we can take the message of the gospel and speak Jesus into their situations. The second thing I take away from this is this. Jesus wants friendship and intimacy with us. He doesn't just want us to just worship him, though he wants us to do that. But he wants to have a relationship with us. And you know, maybe you're here this morning, and, and this is quite strange to you, all of this. But I just say to you that this is what Jesus wants with every person on this earth. And if you're in here this morning, and you don't know Jesus in a personal way, that's what Jesus wants. Jesus wants to be your friend he wants, to have, he wants you to enjoy his forgiveness and he wants to walk your pathway with you in life. However difficult that path may be, Jesus wants to walk it with you because that's the type of relationship that Jesus wants and it comes out of the story so clearly. It, it, it shows that Jesus um, has this deep desire to have communion with each one of us that he created. And the final takeaway on this one is the presence of Jesus can transform us. And, you know, this is the key of the gospel. After Jesus went to Zacchaeus' home, Zacchaeus had an amazing conversion experience and his life was completely turned around. Instead of cheating everybody, he became the most generous person in the village. Now, I'm quite interested in, in money issues, as you know, and, and this story really captivates me. Because to give somebody back four times what you stole from them means you're pretty good at what you do, right? And I asked someone in my investment office, could you calculate for him to do this, what rate of return would he have to get on his assets, right? Zacchaeus had a 65% internal rate of return on his assets. Let me tell you, if I was one of the people that Zacchaeus gave the money back to, I would say, no, no, just hang on to it. I'll give you, I'll give you 20%, whatever you can make for me on this, right? Because <laughs> this must have been a horrible wee man, but this is one of the smartest wee men in the village, let me tell you. And boy, did Zacchaeus know how to make money. But here's the thing. Zacchaeus learned how to turn that for good. Instead of being a miserable, greedy, unhappy wee man, he became a fulfilled follower of Jesus, and he learned the joy of giving. What an amazing transformation. We need to speak the presence of Jesus into and over the relationships that we have with people. Yeah. Back to our main sheet. Yep. Yeah. We need to speak the presence of Jesus into and over our relations with other people. And that leads me on to my final point this morning. Jesus' ministry was conversational and relational to a great extent. And that was what most of his ministry was about. But occasionally, it was confrontational. Usually with the Pharisees or the leaders in government or whatever. He had a difficult relationship with them. But he also would sometimes have other confrontational situations. And there's a story in Mark 5. I'm not going to read it together, but it's Mark 5, verses 1 to 20. And the interesting thing about this, I'm going to just recount the story to you, is Jesus got in the boat, 
He sailed over to the other side of the lake. He stepped off on the other side of the lake. And, and, the, and the country of the Gerasenes, and there was a group of 10 cities called the Decapolis. Now, can you imagine it was a reasonably wealthy group of cities or whatever? He just stepped out of the boat, and there was this crazy guy who lived amongst the tombstones. He, he was possessed with, with evil spirits. They tried to chain him. He had super strength. He could break all the chains out. I mean, imagine he was partially clothed or whatever. He was screaming and wailing. And it tells us here that he cut himself. It's not interesting. There is an epidemic of self-harming amongst our young people today. There's nothing new about any of this. This guy had so little self-worth. And he was so agonized about his situation that he used to cut himself. He was so dis desperate and so despondent. And Jesus engaged with him. And Jesus cast the demons out. And he said to the man, what's your name? The man says, my name is Legion. And Legion means that there are many, hundreds, you know, Legion's a lot, right? And he said he was called Legion because there were so many different spirits inhabiting him and, and, and dementing him. And, and then the, the spirits have a slight conversation with Jesus and they say, you know, we, let us go into these, we need to go someplace. You, we're, we'll come out of this guy, but where do we go? And they say, let us go into the pigs. And there was 2,000 pigs. Can you imagine this? You have to use your imagination with some of these biblical stories, right? You pass a field with your wings and there's maybe, you know, 30 or 40 pigs, these big pigs. They all stand, look at, look at, look at, look at all these pigs. 2,000 pigs. The whole hillside was covered with pigs, right? And the pigs went mental and run down in the water and all, were all drowned in the water. And the man was delivered of his evil spirit. You can imagine what an event this was. And so they went in, he walked into the, uh, 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 the into the village and people said, oh, look at this guy. He's fully clothed and he's right with people. The, sorry, the guys that looked after the pigs ran into the village and they said, you've come and see this. Legion has been cured. And all the people came out and Legion sat fully clothed and in his right mind and fully delivered. And then they start to say to Jesus, they begin to become very apprehensive about Jesus' presence. And the whole mood changes and they become very uncomfortable. Instead of being in wonder and amazement, they get absolutely terrified that this man's amongst them. What's he going to do next, you know? We've just seen a quarter of a million pounds worth of bacon <laughs> run into the loch, you know? What else is he going to do, you know? And so they begin to think, you know, and they say to Jesus, we don't want you here. We want you to leave. And Jesus goes down to the boat and gets on the boat. And Legion comes with him. And Legion says, Lord, I want to come with you. Please let me come with you. This is just amazing. And I want to be part of your ministry. And Jesus said, no. I want you to stay here. I want you to go around these 10 cities. And I want you to tell everybody. Because they all know you. Because everybody talks about you. This was the equivalent of what Jean Ratner used to be in Perth. Everybody knew her, right? She was there all the time, in the street all the time, right? Everybody knew him. So you have to be the person that's to take this message to this community of people. What are the takeaways from this interesting story? Well, you know, I noticed in this story here that it was called Legion. And you're saying, but I'm not sure what relevance this story has to me this morning. You know, I'm, I'm not possessed by demons, no. But I bet your problems are Legion. There are people in here this morning and you've got family confrontations that you're having to deal with. There are people here this morning and you've got financial confrontations that you're having to deal with. There are people here this morning and you've got broken friendships and you're in confrontation and you know you need to deal with it. You may have confrontations in your workplace with maybe your boss or people that you work with. There may be people in here this morning and you're struggling with addiction this morning. And you're just as much a prisoner as Legion was 
who has demons. And there could be a lot of other issues that you've brought with you this morning into this church. And you say, Brian, actually, my problems are legion. I'm legion too. Well, here's the takeaways from this. The first takeaway is this. Our Jesus is all powerful. If you don't get anything else out of today's message, remember this. That Jesus Christ is the greatest power in the universe. And whatever your confrontation is that you are facing, whatever challenge you are facing, Jesus is more powerful than the challenge you are facing in your life. Jesus is more powerful than the addictions that are holding you. Jesus is more powerful than your health problems. Jesus is all powerful. Last year, so it was a couple of years ago, I was speaking in Aberdeen at a fundraising event that Destiny organized. There were quite a lot of people there. And I give a kind of a talk that's partly after dinner talk and then I lead into really, you know, t- sharing testimony or whatever. But I, was, I, was, I got to the bit where I was sharing about the power of the presence of Jesus, just what we're talking about just now, and I was talking about this. And I, I, I said it in a really loud voice. I said, the power of the presence of Jesus. And just at that point, at the table right here in front of me, and it was a, a building as we all set out with tables, a woman started, it was like a convulsion she had. I've never seen anything like this before. And she, 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 her eyes were staring, and she started, I couldn't make out what she was saying, but, you know, it, I, I kept going, obviously, right? And afterwards, I realized what had happened. She had actually manifested a demon in that meeting that night. And the Destiny Church people prayed with her for two hours afterwards. And praise God, she was delivered that night. And we, we learned that she had been dabbling in the occult. And if there's somebody here and that's what you like to do, be very careful. Because when you start that, you open yourself up to forces that are of the devil. So let that be a warning to you. But here's the point. I learned I fresh that evening. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the powers of darkness. Friends, we are in a spiritual battle. This isn't some kind of mamby pamby, just follow a few rules and go along to church occasionally. We are in a battle. We are in a battle against the devil and against his angels. And sometimes it boils through the surface and we see it manifested and it's ugly. But what we have to remember is this. Our Jesus is all powerful and he has won the victory over every demon and over every work of Satan. And we need to call upon his name and we need to pray Jesus' name over our situations. And if you're struggling with some of your confrontations this morning, you need to come and you need to speak Jesus over your situations because he is all powerful. Second takeaway from this, we're nearly through. We have to be witnesses to God's power, to that power. So what happened here was once something happens in our life and sometimes things do, I mean, just being forgiven and knowing Jesus in itself is the greatest miracle. We need to share this with other people and tell them about it, right? But we have to be his witnesses to that. And we've got to, when God's power is manifest, we have to stay in our community. Our theme this morning is about speaking Jesus into and over our community. And that's what Legion did. Jesus said to him, no, you're not coming in the boat with me. I don't want you to be in a monastery or with a group of special disciples. I want you to go back to the Decapolis where everybody knows you and you need to be the witness to my power. You have to tell them what Jesus has done for you and that's what we have to do. And the final point on this confrontational takeaways is this. After this was all over, people were left in one of two conditions. 
They were either delivered or they were disturbed. And this is one of the things about Jesus. When Jesus confronts a situation and when he gets involved confrontationally, right, you will only be left in one of two conditions. You won't be left apathetic or indifferent. You will either be delivered or you will be disturbed. And in this story, it's amazing how the thing is reversed. Because at the beginning of the story, Legion is disturbed. And everybody else is okay. And once the story is over, Legion is delivered and everybody else is disturbed. And Jesus turns the situation on its head. Folks, I sometimes wonder how much we want to see Jesus' power at work. Or sometimes when the Holy Spirit moves, it's a bit scary. We have to be really careful that we're not like the officials in the Decapolis, that we're frightened of what Jesus might do amongst us. And we say to him, actually, Jesus, you know, we're, we're really happy for this guy that he's delivered. But we don't want any more of this. You're scaring us skinny. We want you to go in your boat and we want you to go away. And in the church, we have to be very careful that when the Holy Spirit moves, that we facilitate that. That we see the Holy Spirit blessing something, we, we follow that with our time and our money and we make sure that where the Holy Spirit is working, we are f- following it because we can be an important part of facilitating God's power or we can quench the Holy Spirit by, by not submitting to it and allowing God to do what he wants to do in our lives. I'm going to ask the band to come back up now. Our closing song is I Speak Jesus. And as we, as we go into this song, I want us to think just about this this morning. I do believe that, that this is the message that God wants us. If we are going to speak Jesus into and over our community, then we need to bring Jesus into our conversations. We need to speak the message of Jesus into these conversations. If we're going to do this, then we need to bring him into our relational situation and we need to speak the presence of Jesus into these relations that we have with other people and we need to develop these relations and if we're going to speak Jesus into our community we have to also be confrontational and we have to face the challenges and we have to speak the power of Jesus into and over our confrontations I'd like you to stand with me And as we just go into this song, I want to just say this to you this morning. If you feel that God has spoken to you, if you have situations in your life, and you're saying, Brian, I'll be honest, I need to ask Jesus to speak over these situations in my life. Then the altar is open. You can come and stand at the front. You can kneel on the steps here. Someone from the prayer team will come and join you this morning. But if you, if you feel, actually, I do believe that God has spoken to me this morning. I need Jesus to help me with some of these situations I'm facing just now. I can't do it on my own. I need his grace. My family challenges, I need his grace. I need to speak Jesus into this situation. Then I'm inviting you to come this morning and bring it to Jesus. And the second thing I want to do this morning is I want to say that if you are prepared to be part of this mission, you're saying, I am prepared to take Jesus to the community that is out there in Perth. I am prepared to bring Jesus into my conversations, to bring his presence into my relations, to speak his power over the confrontational situations that I'm coming across. If you're willing to do that this morning, will you make that commitment? You can, you can come forward and make that commitment if you want. You can make it in your seat this morning. But will you make that commitment with me as a church? Lord, have your way. Do this in our presence this morning.
going to stand here at the front myself and the second invitation I'm making this morning is to the church and I'm saying to you if you have this vision 
that we can speak Jesus into and over this community of prayer. I'm inviting you to come and stand with me and say this morning, Jesus, I will do this for you. I will speak into your, I will speak you into my conversations. I will bring you into my relations. I will speak power over the confrontations that I come across. And as we sing this in closing, if you're willing to come and join me in that, then come and join me at the front this morning. this morning that we come to a Jesus who rose from the grave. We come to a Jesus who fed 5,000 people. We come to a Jesus who threw the demons out of the demented man. We come to a Jesus who made a friend of publicans and sinners. We come to a Jesus who had a conversation with the woman that had the worst reputation in the village. We thank you, Lord, that you are there in every circumstance, in every situation. And because you did that, we know you are there for us this morning. And so this morning, we commit ourselves afresh to you, Jesus. For those that came for special needs, we ask, Lord, that you will fulfill the needs in their life and meet them at the point of their despair this morning, Lord. We pray for us as a church, Lord, that you will empower us and help us to go forward from this place with the mission that we will speak Jesus. We will speak Jesus into our community and over every situation. And all God's children said, Amen. And some even shouted, Hallelujah.